Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave with a tool tip that requires some context. Yeah, that's what, this tool tip requires some significant context. And so we start that context with a pop quiz, hot shot. What is this? Most of you know, this is a table saw fence. Uh, what is it for? It is for moving in relation to the saw blade of my table saw that I may cut pieces of precise widths. We all understand that. Uh, in order for this to work properly, it needs to be perfectly parallel to the saw blade. In order for the cuts to be uh, uh, cuts that I can count on, I need to also make sure that the saw blade is perfectly vertical, that it is perfectly perpendicular to the plane of the table. And if my table is perfectly flat and my saw blade is perpendicular to it, and so is my fence, all of these relationships allow me to cut precise things. And this relationship of a blade and a guide, or at least a blade and something that helps me understand the relationship to that blade, it exemplifies many of the tools in this shop. That is a philosophical sort of top line of how machines work. Uh, Jamie likes to joke that one of the things that we've always done for a living is take large chunks of things and make them smaller in precise ways. Nothing could be closer to the truth than that most general of definitions about what it is to, to make stuff in the way that I do it. Um, and in order to remove stuff precisely, you need machines with which you have an understanding of exactly how to place material through that machine in a relationship to its guides to achieve the cutting you want. Now, I have three different ways that I can measure, I have at least three different ways, actually I have four different ways, that I can measure the table saw fence's relationship to the saw blade. I can look down here at the scale that's on the table saw itself. That's one way. I can double check that using a tape measure and get even more exact. But when I need true exactitude, I could use a pair of calipers and figure out exactly what my relationship to the blade is down to, you know, maybe the thickness of a piece of paper. That's the reason I have in, I've described a table saw in this way is in order to get your head into the right frame to talk about my milling machine. This, as should be obvious, this is my milling machine. This is a Bridgeport J head uh, knee, vertical knee mill. Uh, it was built in 1968. Actually, I think the body was built in 68. The head was built in 69. I'm older than my mill, but only by just a little bit. Uh, and the same rules apply to the mill as to the table saw. There is a blade, a cutting surface, and that is the various bits that I can chuck into the mill. Um, some of them cut on their side, some of them cut on their face, some of them cut slits, some of them cut long lines, but they're all blades that chuck into here. Uh, and just like the table saw, the perfect verticality and perpendicularity and parallelism of the various parts of the mill are functionally critical to its proper operation. Um, unlike the table saw in which a single gauge can give you almost all of the measurement information you need, the milling machine, because of its versatility, can't just give you a simple, well, here's where things are. It's too much of a, like the milling machine is built for custom cutting. That Everything you do on the mill is kind of like a custom cut. Now, many of the things we do, we can chuck into a vise and do repeated stuff and it kind of operates like a, a basic tool, but make no mistake, you can modify the various aspects of this tool to make it almost unrecognizable in order to make a specific cut. Um, but everything you do with the mill, the relationship between the blade and the material is the most critical relationship. So how do you determine it? Like again, here on the table saw, 
I need only know what my gauge says, and maybe I'll double check it with a ruler in terms of I'm making a cut, a parallel cut to another cut. That's it, right? That's, that's just one relationship. With the mill, if I'm cutting this way, I wanna make sure that I know where my bit is in relationship to the material. If I'm cutting this way, I want the same. If I'm cutting this way, I want the same. All three of those require um, attunement of the machine to the material every time you put new material into the vise. Okay, we've laid out the ground rules of this tool tip just so you understand. Um, what does that mean that I have to tune this machine every time I use it? Well, at the most basic level, every time I move the vise, I need to what's called retram the vise. That means I grab an indicator set like this one here. I grab an indicator set like my star at indicator. This is a little dial indicator. It's got a plunger on the back, and when you push that plunger, it moves the dial. And every increment on this dial is one thousandth of an inch, and it's jeweled like a watch, so everything spins really nicely. Starrett is just the best. Um, this is actually the very first true machinist tool I ever got. Um, Back in the very early 90s, when I was first learning machining from Jamie, my then uncle Steve uh, was a machinist for the state. And for my birthday, he gave me this magnificent star at indicator case, and I have used it ever since. So let's talk about how this gets used. The indicator has, uh, like I said, a plunger. So basically, I can, I can move that plunger in precise ways and understand where I am by using the dial. So that's one of the ways in which I might make sure that my vice is square to the direction of travel. So I would take a, I would take this and I would, there's a little bit of tinker toying here, attach it to the various rods. Again, this system, this case is literally built to be customizable so that you can tune your mill, your lathe, all sorts of other different types of machines. So uh, for tramming out the vice itself, I might chuck this into I might chuck it into this side piece here, which is uh, a, a small port exactly perpendicular to the travel of the quill. And then I'd bring the vise up to it and I'd run the vise back and forth on this gauge. And if the gauge moves, well, then I know my vise isn't square. But once I get the gauge to stop moving, then I know my vise is totally square. Um, every time I make a big adjustment on the mill, and frankly, really like every few months, it's a good idea for me to make sure that the XY table and the, the, the quill are all exactly perpendicular to each other. That's on a kind of a, a weekly scale, multi-weekly scale. But on a daily scale, every time I put a piece of material into this vise, I also need to use an indicator to understand precisely where I am in relationship to the cutting surface and the stuff I'm going to be cutting. And that requires a different set of tools. I'm going to get to the point of this tool tip. It just requires a little bit of sort of foundational uh, knowledge. And please let me give the caveat. I am so not an expert on the machine tools. I am a dilettante. I am a, le I'm a learning computer. Uh, I am picking this stuff up as I go and I correspond with amazing makers like Tom Lipton, uh, Victor Broadley, this old Tony, and. I ask for advice, I show them pictures of troubles that I'm having, and I get guidance. Um, please don't take anything I'm saying as gospel. This is the way that I do it. And your results may vary, as always. Um, but, where was I? Oh, okay, so I'm at the material stage. Hold on just a second. All right, here is my milling vise. Here are the parallels. They make sure that whatever work I put in here is parallel to the top surface of the vise. And let's say I put a piece of Delrin in there and I stick it out from the side of the vise. Now, if all I want is a square surface here, all I need to do is to bring the, uh, is to bring the milling bit down to where it can cut the material I want and then run it back and forth while it's running, easy enough. However, 
if I want a very precise cut that makes this a precise length that I need, I need to know where this edge of the cutter, where it meets the material, is in relationship to this back edge, right? Until I do that, I can't make an accurate cut here. What I need to do is be able to determine the edge of my material with where the blade is. And I do that using what's called an edge finder. Here is one type of edge finder that is a wiggling type of edge finder. And the way this one works is I chuck this into my mill, I spin it at a low speed, like just a few hundred RPM. Uh, and while it's spinning, I bring it over to the material. And when I reach the material and touch it, and this goes off angle, I'll show it to you for real. When it goes off angle, that off angle is how I know where the edge is. So the edge finder wiggles until I bring it up to the work. And it will get smoother and smoother and smoother. And then it breaks. And again, smoother and smoother and smoother. And then it breaks. Let's watch that a little closer. Starts out way off. As I bring it into the material, it gets smoother and smoother and smoother, and then it pop like that. Now when it does that, the instant it does that, it goes If you look up at the DRO, you will know that that's the place that you've reached the edge. And you zero out. But wait, but wait, that's not the true edge. No, 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 because this little edge finder, that cylinder that meets the material, it has a dimension. That dimension is 200 thousandths of an inch. So in order to realize my actual edge, I need to move the machine 100 thousandths and re-zero it. Now, That's pretty simple math. We're close to the edge, remove a hundred thousands. However, every time you're doing math like that is an opportunity to make a mistake. And it's a mistake that every machinist has made, not accounting for the thickness of their edge finder. Um, and there are some other things you can do that you don't even have to worry about the thickness of the edge finder. You can figure out where the edge finder breaks on both sides, and then just use the half function on your DRO and say, I want exactly halfway between the two lines that I've done. There, you, your DRO can actually get you to an exact split point um, without having to worry about the thickness of your edge finder. There are also edge finders like this one. This is an electronic one. When it touches, a little light comes on. But this is a metric edge finder, which means when I actually, I, I have to measure this exactly with mics and I can't remember how thick it is because I'm imperial and it's metric and that requires me to do this extra math. Again, I don't mean to complain because all of these things allow me to precisely adjust and maintain the relationships between my cutting surface and the thing that I am cutting. But recently, and now we're finally getting to the point, recently I obtained a gauge for doing this, for setting up the mill. I obtained a gauge that allows me to do it in seconds rather than minutes, and it has changed my life. Okay, I'm gonna make one more little point here before I express to you why the hammer gauge changed my life. Just to explain that um, one, of the, one of the difficulties of doing this kind of instrumentation for figuring out where your mill is, uh, using edge finders and wigglers and other things, is that it's rarely just one surface that you need to, to, to register. It's frequently three. Uh, it's this surface, the, the X feed, this surface, the Y feed, and this surface, the Z feed. And when you're doing that, I mean, the edge finder, of course, X and Y are just two different quick operations, but Z can be a whole nother thing. And getting all this, like, I have so many indicators, and every machinist in the world has so many indicators, lever indicators, push rod indicators, etc. because there are 
are so many different ways to screw this up. You end up double checking and triple checking your work. With the hammer gauge, I think a good portion of that labor has passed behind me. And that's got me really excited. Okay, now we can talk about the gauge. There's my hammer gauge. Actually, there is my hammer gauge. This is, uh, does it have a model number on it? actually has a QR code on it. My goodness, that's amazing. Okay, this is my hammer gauge. Uh, it is uh, the smallest one that they make. And the reason I've been giving a lot of lead into this is because this is an expensive tool. I think I paid just under 400 bucks for this. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of money. In the 90s, when I was machining a lot, and I even had on my own small mill, I would have never spent that much money on it. I mean, my welder only cost twice that much, right? And that was like, that was, I, I saved up forever for that thing. So yeah, this is not a tool I would have bought way back when. In fact, I don't think I was ready to understand how good this tool is until right about now in my makeup. Again, I'm not, this isn't gospel. I, I Your results may vary. And if you want to get yourself a birthday present and get yourself one of these, I fully recommend it. Um, but... It's a spendy tool tip, and because of that, I wanted to give a lot of context into exactly what this does for me. So, what does this do for me? Well, um, I have its own, the, the collet system for a milling machine uh, is commonly an R8 collet system, and that just describes uh, the type of taper and uh, relationships so that you can put stuff into the mill and brrr, tighten it down and utilize it. Uh, this is a metric device, even though my mill is imperial. And the only reason that affects me, actually, <laughs> it's funny. I bought one that is measured in imperial units. However, its shaft is still metric, 10 millimeters. So I had to buy a 10 millimeter R8 collet. And I figured, well, that would live with it. So I made a custom case for the two that they may live together. That's a one-day build. You can look for that. We'll, we'll include a link to that in the comments. But at any rate, let's put it in and talk about what this thing can do. Let's say I put some material in here, like that, and I put the hammer gauge in, and I bring it down. Now, so now we have a vise. We have some parallels in the vise. These are also part of the work holding system to allow me to achieve known relationships between my clamping system and my material and the cutting blade that I'm gonna be using. So let's say I chuck this piece of Delrin in and it's nice and solid. How do I measure to this edge? How do I measure to this edge? I bring the hammer gauge over to that edge. There we go. Now the ball here, whoops, sorry. Now the ball here on the gauge is sitting in front of the material. And when I bring up the material to touch the ball, you'll see the needle start to move. There, okay. Now the needle's moving. But how, what information is here about this needle that is useful to me? Well, I'm about to tell you, and it's really awesome. Okay, when I, You'll notice there are two dials here on the hammer gauge, a long one and a short one. The long one measures, I believe, actually I could double check this. Yep, uh, these are thousandths, 25 thousandths, 50 thousandths. So every rotation on the hammer gauge here is 50 thousandths. But the small gauge is still here in the middle. When I bring it a second 50 thousandths, well then, I'm back at zero here and now the small gauge is at zero. And what does that mean? What it means is that the Hamer gauge is doing my math for me. Remember how I said that, hold on. Remember how I said that the cylinder of my edge finder, ooh, sorry. 
Remember how I explained that the cylinder of my edge finder is 200 thousandths, and in order to determine my edge, I had to mathematically remove 100 thousandths from where I determined this edge hit? This is also 200 thousandths, but I don't need to do any math. All I need to do is bring these two gauges to zero, and now I know on the X plane, my spindle is directly centered over this edge. Boom! And I can set my DRO. How do I determine the Y? In the same way, I bring the gauge over to that edge and I bring it until it touches. Okay, now it's moving. And again, just like before, I move it until both dials, the big one and the short one, read zero. And now I know exactly where, now I can basically dial my DRO to sit precisely on this corner. Now I know everything I need to know about the relationship between these sides and these sides and that they're, perpend that they're perpendicular to each other. And I don't have to do any math. I literally bring my gauge to here, I set zero on my DRO, and I am done. Um, ooh, it is also useful for tramming in my mill. Let me, let me explain. When I wanna make sure my vise is properly, properly level to the bed, right, so that Everything I put in here is going to be cut perfectly level. I bring this down, uh, and again, I bring it down. I don't have to, here we go. I just bring it down until it comes around. There we go. Now, this isn't about determining uh, exactly where the this plane is, the Z plane in relation to the cutting tool, but if I scroll it across, well, you can see, well, actually, I recently trammed my mill, but actually you can see this dial moving a little bit. I, it looks like I'm about a thousandth off across the full width of the jaw of my vise. Oh, okay. Um, is that really the case? Let's see. Yeah. Uh, it's actually... Yeah. I'd say across my six-inch vise, what I just learned is that on the z-axis, I'm a one thousandth of an inch higher here than I am over here. That is a fixable problem. And again, I was able to do all of this without moving this gauge whatsoever. So um, why is that useful? Why is that worth almost 400 bucks to me? This reason, it was the, the, that is the most important question and the one that I wanted to give all the pre-context in order to help answer that. Um, when I am setting up work here in the vise and doing this, I may be working on eight, nine, ten parts a day. And every time I take a part and I put it in there, it might take me five minutes to actually adjust the mill to that piece. And every time I'm doing that, times the number of times I'm putting stuff in the vise and taking it out, it adds up. It can be more than an hour or two a day. Uh, I mean, you get better at doing that setup when you get more experience using these machines, but still the time savings between using my edge finder and the hammer gauge, I think with an edge finder, I can determine two edges in the halfway mark in about two minutes. And with the hammer gauge, I can do it in about probably 15, 20, 30 seconds. So like a time factor savings of four. That's, for someone who likes to work quickly, that's totally worth the dough to me. And it's funny, um, I was corresponding with this old Tony, who after I released the one day build of the Wiggler, which is a great way to find the center of a circle, he was like, I almost sent you a hammer gauge. <laughs> And I bought one before he did, uh, the generous man, uh, because he could tell how much it was going to change my life before I was able to understand that. Um, what's funny is I checked the forums of the Practical Machinist and some other uh, uh, build forums for home machinists, and there's not a lot of information out there about using Hamer gauges on manual machines. They are the de facto gauge for CNC machining, but using them on home machines is a phenomenal use case 
but I could find precious little about it. So I'm hoping this video adds to some institutional knowledge that those of us home manual machinists have about the utility of this beautiful thing right here. Thank you guys for joining me for this tool tip. That is without a doubt, I think the longest and most convoluted tool tip I have yet done. <clears throat> Enjoy the precision of the work that you do and I will see you next time. Thanks guys.